Many people spend a great deal of time and effort arguing and debating about what they believe to be the truth concerning their understanding of God, who he is. If he is, if he exists at all, and if he exists, how can we expect him to act towards us who are his creation? And for reasonable thinking, men and women, these are questions that require some kind of an answer. But the variety of answers that are presented to us by various religions in the world and by people with a wide variety of opinions seems to just create more questions rather than answers, and so more confusion. So many people create a God of their own in their mind. They believe that whatever they think about God is true. But that uh, perspective is not only foolish, it seems to be dangerous because it ignores the written communication that we have been given by God in his word, in the Bible. Because in the pages of this book, God has explained to us the way that things really are. How he sees us. And how does he see us? He says we're like sheep. We've wandered away from him in rebellion against him. And he sees our need. He sees that we need to be rescued from our sin. So he tells us that he sends a Messiah to save us from our sins. He points out that this Savior will come. Where does he point it out? In the Old Testament, he gives us pictures of him. He gives us a picture of the one who will be sent from heaven. And in the New Testament, he shows us, reveals to us, and tells us of his arrival on this earth. He's laid it all out for us in his love. He has pointed out our need of Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Savior of the world. God has met our need for salvation. And he has met it in Jesus Christ and in him alone. That is the clear teaching of the word of God. And as if we, as we've been looking at the the letter of Hebrews in the New Testament. Hasn't that been the focus of the writer of this letter? Hasn't he told us that we should look nowhere else except to Jesus Christ? That he alone transcends all things? That he is preeminent over everyone, over everything that exists on this earth that has ever existed and that will ever exist. So the writer of Hebrews has encouraged us not to put our trust anywhere else, but to put our trust, to put our confidence in Jesus Christ, who he says is seated At the right hand of God the Father, in heaven, seated in power and in glory, ever living as our great high priest, interceding for us on our behalf with God the Father. But the writer tells us, tells his readers, that only those with spiritual understanding, only those with wisdom that comes from God can understand these things. Only they can comprehend this truth. The truth that in the Old Testament, the plan of God was already in place. He was just waiting for the right time for it to unfold, for it to be revealed. Even as far back as Abraham. Even before the nation of Israel existed, God had a plan beyond what would even be given to that nation. A plan beyond the ceremonial law. 
a plan beyond the rituals, a plan beyond the Levitical priesthood, a plan to bring those who would come to Christ, come to him for salvation into a relationship with the very God of the universe. A plan to bring us into the very presence of God. Yes, our salvation, our faith in Christ gives us forgiveness. It gives us forgiveness for our sins. Yes, as we learn of Him in His Word, as we obey Him, we deepen our, our knowledge of Him. We deepen our relationship with Him, our fellowship with Him. But, in addition to that, it is only our relationship with Christ, only His blood, only His sacrifice, that can give us access into the presence of God, access into His presence to live in the light of the presence of Jesus Christ. And this is a unique privilege for only those who belong to him. Something that rituals and ceremonies, something that religion or philosophy cannot do. This is a radical statement, isn't it? But remember what the writer of Hebrews told us. Back in verse 1 of chapter 6, when he told us and his readers that the only way into the presence of God, the only way to get there, requires a radical decision. We must abandon everything, he said. We must abandon everything that we know of God or that we think we know. We must abandon the traditions, let go of the opinions, let go of the incorrect teaching that we've been given. Let go of our misunderstanding concerning Jesus Christ. The shadows, the pictures that we find in the Old Testament. The writer calls on us to abandon what he calls the elementary principles, the ABCs. And he says we need to move forward. Move forward to maturity. He says this is Nothing to do with the spiritual growth of a believer. That comes later. But that's not what he's talking about there. He's talking about maturity, but it is in salvation. Teleotas, completeness in Christ. That is what he's talking about. Without Christ, we are incomplete, so we are imperfect. So now, he says, in verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 7, if perfection, teleosis, same word as used in 6.1, translated as maturity, if this completeness in Christ, if salvation through him was through the Levitical priesthood, a system that is outlined in the Old Testament, though he says the basis of that system through it, the people received the law. They received the ceremonial law. They received the rituals. They performed the animal sacrifice. They received the pictures. They received the shadows. Shadows of things to come in Christ. Even though that is true, the writer says, that system was inadequate. It was inadequate to give us a real relationship with God. A completeness in Him. If salvation could be found there, if for forgiveness of sin could be found in the blood of bulls and goats, well then, what further need was there for another priest to arise? Why would we need this priest to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sin. Why would we need a Messiah? There would be no need for Jesus Christ to have come to earth to die for us. 
if those sacrifices, those animal sacrifices could save us. There are two Greek words for this word, another. One of them is alos. It means another of the same kind. Then there is another word in Greek, and that is the word heteros. That means another of a different kind. Here, in the pages of this passage, the Holy Spirit uses the word heteros. Jesus Christ is a priest who arises from a different line. He comes from a different place. He is a different kind of priest. The Levitical priesthood was only for a limited time. It was only for a season. And even before it existed, even as far back as Genesis chapter 14, we are told that the priesthood of Christ is pictured where? It says in the order of Melchizedek, who was a man who was a king and a priest in the city of Salem. King of righteousness, we're told, in the city of peace. Picture of Christ. A man whose lineage, man whose family history was unknown to us. And so, if there was a Levitical priesthood at that time, he would not have been designated or lego given a place in that priesthood, would he? He didn't have the right background. He didn't have the credentials according to the order of Aaron. Just as Jesus would not have become part of that priesthood. Why? Because he wasn't of the tribe of Levi in the house of Aaron. And yet, we are told that This Melchizedek blessed Abraham. The greater blessed the lesser. And we are told that Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. The lesser honored the greater. There is a greater than Abraham. There is a greater than the Levitical priesthood. It is pictured in Melchizedek, but it is Christ who is pictured. And so, this priesthood is no longer needed. The picture is no longer needed. It's gone. The writer of Hebrews says it's been set aside. Because it could not do what Jesus Christ has done. It's ineffective. Because it cannot give us access into the presence of God. To Christ, we're told in Ephesians 2.18. Through Him, we have access to the Father. He is a priest who gives us access into the throne room of God Almighty. No wonder there needed to be a change in the priesthood. For when the priesthood is changed, we're told, verse 12, meta Tithemi, when it is replaced, when it is exchanged for another priesthood, the priesthood of Christ, the Son of God. Of necessity, it says, ananke, it is inevitable that this will happen, that there takes place a change of law also. What law? What is he talking about? Not in the moral law of God. That doesn't change, does it? In fact, it was Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount who strengthened that law when he said not only to look at the actions, look at the motives of the heart. So what is this change in law? This is the change in the ceremonial law. It's gone. Since the priests are gone... The entire structure now has been replaced as well. The old order is no more. Behold, a new order has come. It has come through the final word of God given to us through his beloved son. So why 
the writer of Hebrews, wonders why do you want to be enslaved to a system all over again that can never bring you into the presence of God? Makes no sense, does it? Why would you turn away from the one that you know or that you claim to know? Why would you turn around and go back outside of the veil when Jesus Christ has carried you into the veil, into the Holy of Holies, and into the presence of God? Not a good answer for that, is there? Why? Why would people do that? But you know, that was the problem in the early church, wasn't it? Isn't that what the confusion was all about with some people? They had a relationship with Jesus Christ, but they said that it was important for people to comply with the ceremonial laws of their Jewish background as an extension of their relationship with Christ. They demanded everyone comply with those laws. And today, some people have the same problem, don't they? They find it difficult to let go of the of the rituals, of the practices, things from their background, things from their past. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. All of us do. We need to listen to him through his word. For Christ is the one, we're told in verse 13, concerning whom these things have been spoken and proclaimed. Christ, it is Christ alone who is our great high priest. He is the one, the writer said, who belongs, meteko, who shares his earthly background with another tribe in the nation of Israel. A different tribe tribe that wasn't recognized as part of the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, wasn't recognized in the nation of Israel. It is a tribe, the writer says, from which no one has officiated, prosecco. No one has taken care of the things of God at the altar as a priest who comes from the tribe that Jesus came from. At least, not anyone who lived a long and prosperous life. We, we remember Uzziah. Uzziah. An Hebrew king in Judah. Who overstepped his bounds of authority. Went into the temple to offer incense. Ended up as a leper for the rest of his life. But now consider Jesus, the writer tells us. When it was time for his earthly family to pay their taxes to the Roman government, they went where? To the city of Bethlehem, the place where Jesus was born, verifying that they were of the house of David. That is, David who was the king, and David was from the tribe of Judah. The tribe, the place where the prophet Micah prophesied in Micah chapter 5, 700 years before any of it happened, that this would be the place where the Messiah would go forth as a ruler in Israel. The tribe of Judah, that's where he would come from. A tribe that's mentioned as far back as Genesis chapter 49 verses 9 and 10 where we are told the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. But, like Melchizedek, who pictured Christ, Jesus is both king and priest. For it is evident, the writer says in verse 14, pro delos, it is clear from the information that we have already been given. It is clear that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which 
Moses spoke nothing concerning priests when he received the law on Mount Sinai. He never was given any information about a priest who would come from Judah. But since Christ is both king and priest, his priesthood supersedes the instructions that were given to Moses on that mountain by God. Why? He goes beyond them. Why? Because God said it would happen that way. Christ, in Christ, the Levitical priesthood has been shattered forever. And this is clearer still, the writer says in verse 15. Katadileos, it is more abundantly evident. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. It's irrefutable. Unless we choose to ignore the facts. Facts that are staring us right in the face. Which is what some people do, don't they? They ignore this truth, even though it's obvious. It's obvious, isn't it? If another priest arises, anistemi, if he arises, rises like the sun, the way Jesus arose. Acts 2.32, it said he was raised from the dead. Same word, anistemi. This word here in verse 15 is a little, a little deeper than that. It's re- reflexive in Greek. This priest, this Christ, rises by himself. He rises according to his own power, power that he has within himself. It's only Jesus Christ who's done that. And didn't Jesus say he would do that in John chapter chapter 10? Where he said, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me. I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. Jesus is our great high, high priest who has risen from the dead. And who lives forever, according to the likeness, the writer says, the homoi otes, according to the picture, the pattern of Melchizedek. As David said he would, in Psalm 110 verse 4. It's all there in the scriptures. It's obvious, isn't it? And we're told that this Melchizedek, Hebrews 7, 3, remains a priest continually, at least on the pages of Scripture, as a picture of Christ. It's a picture of our Savior, our risen Savior, our great high priest who is in the heavens. And Jesus has become such. He is our risen Lord. But he's a different kind of priest, isn't he? He's not a priest, the writer says in verse 16, not on the basis of the law of physical requirement. Sarkinos. Prescribed rules and and ordinances that are focused on the flesh. Focused on the right family, the right background, the right tribe, the right ancestry. He's not like that. He's not a priest on the basics, basis of the requirements that are found in Leviticus chapter 21 either. Requirements that the priests have no physical defect, no deformity, no abnormality. But these are all things that are external, aren't they? These are things that are all physical, physical requirements. Doesn't speak anything about the heart, does it? Doesn't speak anything about character. But the qualifications of Christ, we're told, are different. They're not external, and they're certainly not superficial. But they are according to the power, the dunamis, 
the miraculous power, the infinite strength of an indestructible life, a akatalutos, a life that can never be torn down, a life that can never be dissolved. Jesus Christ is a priest who lives forever. For it is witnessed of him, the writer says. It is testified of him in the scriptures. The scriptures bear witness to this truth. Thou art a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Forever, it says. Aeon. For all eternity. Jesus Christ is the living one, the ever-living one who saves us forever. How foolish not to come to Christ for salvation. How foolish to look anywhere else. For on the one hand, the writer says, there's a setting aside of the former commandment. Atethesis. What has gone before is null and void. And what's that? The rituals? The ceremonies? They're gone. They had no power. They had no force. They had no validity. So the priesthood that administered those ceremonies, that's gone also. It's all invalid. Because of what? Because of its weakness. Asthenes. Because it had no power to make us right with God. So it is useless, the writer says. Anopheles. It's ineffective to bring us to a place where we need to be brought. It's ineffective to bring us to salvation. To be saved. For the law made nothing per- perfect. Teleo, same word as verse 11. The law, the sacrifices, could not lead us to completion in Christ. It could not lead us to salvation. It could not lead us to a relationship with Him. So, we remained at a distance from God. We remained far away from him because our sin still separated us from him. Ah, but the writer says, on the other hand, to Christ, now there is a bringing in, an episagoge, an introduction to something new. Something new has taken place. We have, he says, a a better hope, a greater expectation, a hope that is steadfast and sure, guaranteed not to fail, guaranteed to take us through the storms of life, guaranteed to take us all the way home to heaven. It's our only hope. Writer says this is our only hope, our hope in Christ through which we are able now, he says in verse 19, to draw near to God. And Gizzo, now in Christ, we can approach the throne of grace. We can come before the throne of God and have no fear. We have access to him. We live, we move. We have our breath in him, in his presence. We live in his presence. We remain there forever. This is the fulfillment of the promise that God has made throughout his entire word. A promise that has been fulfilled, given to us. A promise that for those who will believe, we can come into the presence of God. We are no longer at a distance from him. We are no longer far off. Now we're near to God. We have access. We live in his presence through Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Not just for eternity. We live in his presence now and forever. Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.